Man, welcome out to conference tonight. Let's find our seats, stand in this place. Clap our hands as we sing out, blessed be your name. Come on, let's go. And blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. The streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Oh, come on now, blessed be your name. And blessed be your name. Though I walk through the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessing. Amen. Let's lift our voice, sing it out. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be your name, I'm the Lord. Blessed be your name, Oh Church. Blessed be your name. The Lord, blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun is shining. Oh, coming out when the world's all that it should be. Let's lift our voices, we sing it out. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road on with suffering. Though there's pain in the hour blessed be your name. Oh, every blessing you pour out, come on. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, and blessed be your name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Let's sing it again tonight. Blessed be your name. Come on. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, and blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be all you give and you take away. Come on, let's go. You give and you take away. You give and you take away. But my heart you choose to say, Lord, let us sing again. Now you give and you take away. You give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Blessed be the name of
church tonight we want to come before God amen and we want to pray and I want to pray for two things amen tonight I want to pray for Pastor Dax and Sister Rose and their children over in Bougainville amen they're obviously not here with us but we want to pray we want to pray that God's blessing will be upon them that as we are here together that they will also be with us in spirit amen and they'll as they're watching the the streams that get uploaded they'll be uh, filled amen with the the preaching and the ministry of uh, what, what we've been receiving here this week And let's also just continue to pray for this conference, amen, and believe that God is going to pour out a last day's revival, amen. Why don't we all just lift our voices this evening and let's pray. And as we do, Pastor Scott's going to come and uh, open us in prayer. Let's pray, church. Father, right now, God, we come before you, Lord. We're asking right now, Holy Spirit, that you would indeed move upon us, my God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we can be in your house this night, gathered in one mind and one accord, Lord God. God, we lift up and we glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God. God, the wonderful privilege it is to be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. God, that you would begin to move upon this conference body, Lord God, we pray, God. God, that you would continue to breathe life, breathe refreshing, my God. We come with expectant hearts, my God. We come, my God, with humble hearts, my God, that you would begin, my God, to move in our lives, God. God, we pray for a rainbow word from heaven that you would anoint the ministry tonight. God, let your spirit be blurred out in these final days, Lord God. In these last days, that there would be a great awakening in the hearts of men and women, Lord God. God, that there would be a great awakening, my God, in this city, Lord God. God, we desperately need the touch of the Holy Spirit, my God. We desperately need, my God, an outpouring, my God, like never before, Lord God. God, you see the wickedness of man, my God. You are not surprised, God. And if anything, God, we are more than ever desperate, my God, for a fresh anointing, God. God, let nothing be done by the works of man's hands, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. God, we want you to breathe a fresh life upon this conference body, my God. We might be weary, we might be, Lord God, Lord God, exhausted by this world, my God, but we'd find refreshing in you, my God, to go at it until your son Jesus comes down in the clouds, God. God, we pray tonight also, Lord God, for those who aren't here, my God, that your spirit, my God, would be, Lord God, indeed encouraging those members of our congregations that aren't here, my God, as they, Lord God, can participate wherever they can. We lift up Pastor Dax and Rose, my God, as they're in Burgundy. Bergenville, Lord God, and the Bergenville congregation, God. God, that you'd continue to build a mighty work there, Lord God. Use your servant, my God, to set that nation on fire for you, Lord God. And revival would break out of that nation, Lord God, as nations before, Lord God. And God, we contend for unity, my God. We contend for like-mindedness. We contend, my God, for your spirit, my God, to join us together, my God, in the great endeavor of these last days, God. God, that we would pursue you with passion and joy and vigor, Lord God. God, for there is joy, my God, in your presence, my God, and there is revival, Lord God. Let our hearts hunger for your outpouring. I pray you anoint Pastor Huggins tonight, my God. Let your word, my God, come through his lips. Uh, Let your word be ministered through his heart, my God, and that we would receive, my God, what it is that you're wanting to say. We pray your anointing upon this conference body in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen, amen. Why don't we just all turn and acknowledge someone, say, hey, welcome out. Good to see Oh, he's 
I just want to welcome everybody out tonight to our 2022 Brisbane Conference. Uh, if it's your first night, we're glad that you could be here with us. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord this evening. Uh, just a few announcements. As I said last night, amen, uh, we do have nursery out the back. So for those, if it's your first time you have a child, you can utilize that from the age of zero to two and a half. Uh, tomorrow morning as well, the kids club, uh, there'll be... You know, it's, it's, they have a good time over there. Let's just put it at that. Um, Brother Sean Guiney is telling some interesting stories that I think even I would like to hear some of them. Amen. Um, so that's tomorrow morning. You can take your kids and drop them off there from 8.40 and uh, pick them up at the donut break. Uh, morning prayer as well. Please come join us for morning prayer from 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and that will be for 45 minutes. So up until 8.45. And if you haven't already done so, book your seats so that you can get a seat, amen. We don't want people coming and thinking, oh yeah, we can just rock up and, and, and jump into wherever we want, otherwise you will be sitting at the front, so <laughs> amen. I mean, we all love sitting at the front. Um, amen. This evening we're blessed, amen, that we can have the reports as a part of our conference and we're going to have these men come up and they're going to share a bit about themselves and what God is doing in their cities. We have Pastor Reuben, Pastor Bobby and Pastor Steve that are going to come up and share, uh, give a report. Amen. Let's make them feel welcome. Praise God. Amen. Hope you're all enjoying conference. Uh, we've been having a great year, and God's, no, I'm going to be honest, it's been absolutely horrible. Amen. And uh, no, nah, there's a few downs, no doubt, and uh, some things that went down in our church, but God has really strengthened and blessed our church. A couple notable miracles. Uh, early in the year, in January, I believe it was, uh, a lady by the name of Jenna came into our church. Uh, we'd left a sign up for a little bit too long, maybe two months, and so she had continued to see it again and again. For four years straight, she had been smoking uh, meth and hitting meth every single day, couldn't function without it. Came to church, uh, prayed a prayer of repentance, uh, got gloriously delivered, uh, and hasn't touched it since all year. Hallelujah. And she's just such a blessing. Um, early in the year, we have our poly flavor event. Uh, we do it every um, February 5th. Uh, we did it uh, last year, and uh, we had we organized about 10 to 12 food stalls, all a uh, bunch of poly food. Uh, had some professional dancers that unfortunately pulled some Maruka girls out of the crowd and started dancing with them, so I apologize for that. But listen, 25, uh, uh, 2,500 people roughly came out to this. Uh, we got over... Uh, 600 different contacts from this. Uh, we had 70 people give their lives to Jesus. We had revivals with Steve Stefan, Mick Listing, Dan Villani, all great revivals that God moved. Uh, God's just really been growing our church, not just by number, but in maturity. And people are growing in maturity, really just uh, strengthening themselves and uh, building and growing like this. And so we've got a full worship team now. We have a usher team. We have a Sunday school teachers. Everything's uh, uh, beginning to be helped out like that. Uh, we've got a secret sisters ministry where 30 odd ladies, um, um, they're not odd, amen, but 30 or so ladies, hallelujah, pray for one another, give gifts to one another, take care of each one, each another. And they had a big, huge dinner just about a month ago, which was just a great hit. In the past two months, though, uh, God has brought in about nine uh, just genuine converts, families, uh, couples, single people, radical guys that are on fire. God's really burning inside of them, and they're excited for the call of God. And uh, one of these couples I actually married three weeks ago. They got married. They got born again, and they're just saying, Pastor, we don't want to live like this anymore. What's the answer? And so they got right. They got married. Amen. And so church is good, and it's blessed. I want to thank you. Uh, all the churches for their impact teams this year, your help uh, is, is just goes a long way and we appreciate you. I want to thank Pastor Payne, I want to thank Pastor Elliot, Pastor Field and Kerry and the Strathpine Church for putting this on for us. It's a blessing and we thank you so much. I want to thank my awesome wife Danielle that I couldn't do this out without her, hallelujah. And I want to thank the Springfield Church, amen. It's a blessing to serve you. God bless you, have a good conference, amen. Hi, my name is Bobby. Uh, my wife Zara and my three children, we 
took over a wonderful church over in Beanley on the south side. And I want to tell you, we are very humble. It is our honor and privilege to serve in that uh, church. Uh, last year, our focus was primarily on just spiritual maturity and growth in our congregation. And so we started off the year with a revival with Pastor Sean Reeves. And that's been a, a great kickstart to the year. Uh, many of our guys testify saying it was because of this revival that I'm here uh, and I'm serving God. And I'm telling you what, it was a great revival. Uh, there's, certainly be, uh, there's certainly been lives that have been truly changed from Pastor Sean's ministry. And we've had Pastor Field come do a, a uh, revival for us as well, preaching some rich congregational sermons into our church. And this is something we've been contending for, something we've been praying for. And uh, all these highlights, I mean, we can go on. That throughout the year, our church has been blessing some visitors just walk in off the streets, come in and get saved. But not just come in and get saved, and, but really come in and just uh, come in every service and being faithful towards the church and being disciples. Uh, one family walked in. Uh, here is a family that a uh, young man got witnessed to by Pastor Dax in Eagleby. And then a few years later, he comes back into the church and says, oh, where's the white guy? Where's the? I said, oh, sorry, he's, he's gone to where I came from. <laughs> he's gone to PNG. <laughs> so they sent a PNG guy over here. So anyway, he, him and his family come in and they, they are on drugs. They are hooked on cigarettes and they come in, get saved. And no joke, he is off the cigarettes. Uh, they're completely delivered. And they come to church service, every single service. And not only that, they come to prayer. These guys are hungry for Jesus Christ. It's like, what else can we do for Jesus? What, Pastor, what else can we do? What are some things we can do to live for Jesus Christ? I'm telling you what, converts are the key to building a congregation. So not only is it the highlights of people getting saved, but the real highlight is certainly the people in our church. People are taking initiative. People are the... Our church people are the ones doing the follow-up. They're the ones calling up and uh, calling up and asking people to catch up for coffee, catching up and caring for them one-on-one. -on -one. And these guys are now also taking initiative in running concerts. That they're taking initiative running barbecues, organizing youth nights. Uh, one of our ladies have organized Christmas dinners, delegating all these things. Uh, ladies hosting women's Bible studies and worship nights, men doing Bible studies, reaching out to other young men. One of our young men is growing, faithful young men preaches when I'm away. Another young man is getting, uh, you know, trained up to be the next song service leader. Hallelujah. There's another lady who's in our church as well, faithful and capable, came to my wife and said, listen, I can't sing, I can't dance, but hey, can I take care of the nursery for you? I was like, my wife's like, yes, absolutely. You know, how many ladies know that's a, a massive blessing? So all in all, the year, it's just on this particular church, and it's just seeing wonderful men and women rise up in spiritual growth. Young men and women are getting jobs, trades, cars. People are getting promotions in their work. And I'm telling you, last year was a focus on spiritual growth and maturity. And I'm, I'm proud to say, you know what, I'm proud of our congregation. I'm proud of what Jesus has done in all these young men and women's lives. And I'm looking forward to another 2022. I just want to thank the Beanley Church. Thank you for accepting our family. Thanks, guys, for accepting myself and my wife and my children. And I want to thank also Pastor Field. And Kerry, thank you so much for your investment in all our lives. I want to thank my wife and my children coming along in this journey. And I want to thank Jesus Christ. God bless you. Hallelujah. All right, my name is Steve Kenaway and my incredible wife of nearly 34 years, Michelle. Um, we now labor in Townsville, Queensland. We took the church there in 2018. We serve a faithful, faithful congregation there. Uh, just on the last year, 2021, we had visiting speakers. We had uh, Pastor Francesca come. We had Sean Reeves, Ash Adams, and Bobby Woods. And I was so impressed with the ministry of these young men. Uh, Albert's not so young, but anyway, the young men. Uh, and just the depth of their ministry and what they added to our congregation. And it was such a great blessing for them to come and serve the Townsville Church in that capacity. So we really do uh, thank God for that. Uh, our church is healthy and strong. We desperately need breakthrough, though. We need a revival. Uh, I'm listening to these reports, and I'm hearing about impact teams and support. I want to encourage you, remember regional Australia. Remember regional Australia. And uh, I'll talk about that again in a moment. Hallelujah. But we are really the highlight of our year last year was that we bought a building in November. 
And uh, we are not a large church. But, you know, when people get a vision and they begin to plan and begin to give and a liberal, we made the decision uh, collectively. I, I'm sure it was driven by me as the pastor, but I got the men together and said, you know what, we need a change. We need to move out of the building that we've been into uh, for over 30 years in the same building. And it's seen various stages of growth and different things, but it was time for a change. Uh, the men rallied with me, said, yes, pastor, we'll do it. We moved into a school facility and we were there for three and a half years. We began to save money originally just so that we could have some money to put carpet on a floor when we moved into a new rental accommodation somewhere. But just God began to help us financially and the bank account began to get larger than I thought it would initially. And so I began to think, you know what, we need to think larger and begin to plan towards buying a building. Uh, we live again in regional Australia and buildings are relatively affordable there even for churches that are not so large. And so we just began to continue to believe God and pray for the right building at the right, sorry, the right property at the right place, the right price and the right time. And uh, anyway, that happened in November. We bought a building, $500,000 worth of building. Uh, we were able to put 30% deposit down on that building. And so we have a mortgage now that costs us less than rent would cost us. And that's including our expenses and uh, needs a bit of work and uh, needs a bit of, uh, you know, TLC to make it as an ex-doctor's surgery. It's not a large building. We're not a large church, and, but it has vacant land that when we outgrow the building we have, we can build a brand new building right next door and uh, probably seat up to 250, 300 people in that building that we could build in that time. So pray for us. That's what we need. And we need God to help us in that, in that regard. We are so blessed, though, to have our own place and just even the emphasis now when back in the building for morning prayer and we can do whatever we want. It's got nicer at the moment, grass the kids can play on and we can have outdoor movies on and various things like that when the weather improves uh, in the coming months. So that's exciting for us. You know, it's only nine churches in the Australian Fellowship that own buildings, only nine of us. And uh, two of those are in capital cities, that's Beachborough and Elizabeth in Adelaide. And uh, the rest of them are owned by regional Australia. So if you wanna go and preach the gospel, go to regional Australia. You could eventually be able to buy a building there, hallelujah. Uh, much more affordable than the big cities and, and uh, so on. Yet the only thing is you might not get as many impact teams uh, as you might get in the big cities. But I'm asking for an impact. So this is going to turn now from a report to a request to a, rec a recruitment. <laughs> hallelujah. We need in Townsville an impact team with a difference. We need some tradesmen to come and visit us there. So... I'll let you think about that, pray about that, talk to your pastor about that, and uh, I'm happy to put my phone number on the screen or whatever I need to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we need some tradesmen to come uh, help us out so we can get the building fitted out like we need to. We're waiting on some engineering plans at the moment that can help us to remove some walls. Uh, and then we need, you know, carpenters, uh, uh, electricians, plumbers, plasterer, uh, and that's a good start anyway. And uh, maybe some of their wives can come to cook food for them. I don't know. We have to pray for us in Townsville. We really are so grateful to the Strathpine Church. Uh, we've been able to connect with you from time to time. I really do appreciate Pastor Field. I've known him since he was a new convert uh, in the Darwin Church. Uh, I've known Kerry Field since I was in her mass class in 1984. And that's the reason that I got drawn into the fellowship and got saved uh, because of her impact and her witness as a teenager. God is good. God is doing good things. Uh, we have a great year ahead of us, and we know that. And so pray for us. We thank God for you, and God bless you. Amen. If you have a Bible and you'd like to turn tonight to Exodus chapter 36, Exodus chapter 36. I'm curious to how many of you know what the rarest commodity in the world is. What do you think is the most priceless, most expensive beyond any other thing in the world? You probably don't know the answer. I was reading about this recently. It's called astatine or astatine. Forgive me here, uh, Pastor Joel Anderson, our resident engineer, if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But I was reading about this. It's actually an, uh, an element that we find on planet Earth, and it's the byproduct of other heavy materials. And what happens is as they begin to decay, they produce this uh, commodity called uh, astatine, and there's only 25 grams of it on the Earth's surface at any time. Now, the reason why it is so expensive and so valuable is because it's radioactive. 
It's a, it's a natural thing. And it only lives for 8.1 hours. So it has an 8.1 hour shelf life. And I was thinking about what I read about this commodity and I don't agree with it. And I want to tell you what I believe is the greatest and most priceless and rarest commodity on the whole earth. It is preachers of the gospel. It's preachers. If you think about these reports that men gave tonight, think about some of the lives, the addictions, the people that get married, the, the transformation of somebody's life. Do you know that is simply because a preacher preached the word of God for them? And I say that because where we're going to read tonight is the building of the tabernacle. And there's a spirit in these people that I want us to be able to see in the word of God. Moses has been given the responsibility of building this uh, tabernacle for God. There's many, many specifics, a very clear plan that goes into how this has to be built and what has to happen. But I want to read Exodus 36, verse 2 and 3. And it says, Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan whose heart the Lord had put wisdom. Everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Now I want to talk to you about the conference. Because what the conference is really all about is the preachers. We know it's about the Word of God, but it's somebody delivers the Word of God. We know uh, it's, it's men preaching. And what I, I want to tell you, what an incredible group of men we have here, the quality of what they've preached already this week. I want to tell you, you they, trust me, out there people don't get this everywhere. And that's what a conference is really all about. It's about many, many things, but it's particularly designed to be a blessing to the preacher. It's to help the preacher. It's to refresh them. It's to motivate them. It's to help them perhaps recalibrate, get back on track in some areas. There's a, there's a rejuvenation that happens. Uh, the other thing that happens is it's, it's, a, it's an arena where other men who are called to preach or potentially want to become a preacher can be inspired. As they watch other men, as they listen to other men, as they hear the word of God, and it's, a, it's in that setting. I, I can remember the first Bible conference I ever went to, uh, and, and I, I didn't feel called in that conference. I felt called before that, but there was something about being in that conference that just opened up my eyes to realize that, that God was working in many places in the earth, and there was something in that Bible conference that began to, to bring about a change. Because the impact of a gospel preacher is immeasurable. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what people give their lives for. There's so many things and they're valuable and they're valid. But the preacher is so unique. It says in Ecclesiastes 11, 9 to 11, Moreover, because the preacher was wise. Think about what this is saying. He still taught the people knowledge. He pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Uh, the preacher sought to find acceptable words. Uh, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise uh, are like goads and the words of scholars uh, are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And I can tell you when you're a preacher and you write hundreds of sermons and you watch and listen to a man preach, you know the only way that he got like that is through practice. I, I can tell when men are preaching this week, I can tell what they're thinking even when they're not saying it. I can tell how their thought pattern worked to put that sermon together, where they're coming from. Sometimes uh, they're saying something, but they're not really saying that at all. Sometimes they get close to the mark uh, and they stop, but really, uh, I know exactly what they're saying. You know what I'm talking about. Many of you know your own pastor when he's preaching, even how he's thinking, uh, because uh, all of the endeavor that goes into doing what? To preparing the word so that someone can be helped. That is why we have conferences. I know it's many other things, but let's get back to what it's about. It's about helping these men that have given themselves to ministry. 
Now then what happens is when you go into a conference like this, there's a blueprint. There's preparation, there's planning, there's forethought, there's organisation, there's all of the things that go into it and then there's the execution of the plan and we're pretty much midway through executing that plan this time in January 2022. Uh, but there's one part that I want to bring your attention to. Uh, it's almost craziness uh, and that is paying for it. And you know something? There isn't a plan. <laughs> it's done completely in faith. And, I, and I'm, I'm trying to be very clear tonight to help many of you. Perhaps you've never been to a conference before or one or two, you don't know how it works. So there's no charging for a conference. We don't get people to put down a deposit. We don't ask people, can you tell us how many are coming so we can work out, you know, the profit margin, how many hamburgers we sell, how much we'll make. Uh, we're going to make sure we've covered the, the rent. You know what? It's incredible going into a conference. Uh, it's done completely in faith. It's embarked on in faith. That is the financial plan. Now, that is why the attitude that you and I have toward it is so important. Because what it really comes down to is our heart and our spirit. This is really, at the end of the day, what makes the whole thing work. It's our attitude. I see about men in the Bible like Barnabas, and we all love to preach about him, the son of encouragement. And we know that was something that he did was he sacrificed what he had for the sake of the church, didn't he, for everybody else. You think about Mary, the alabaster box of oil that she took something incredibly valuable and she, she poured it out. She could have kept it for herself, but she, she relinquished it. She sacrificed it. I was thinking about Zacchaeus, who because he's so saved and he's so grateful that he, he, he first of all, he restores and pays back to people what he ripped them off for. And not only that, he was, he was generous as well. And he began to restore fourfold. He took half of what he owned and he began to give it to the poor. That is the spirit, listen to me, people, that we've got to have. That is the spirit that makes a conference work. It's that heart, it's that attitude towards that. Now I want to give you a little history here because in 2010, it was the first conference that I was in here in Queensland. I think in the daytime, we maxed out at 35 people. Oh, it was a powerful time. <laughs> That's it, 35 and if you look around tonight, and we are depleted, literally 100 more plus people because of the illness that's around. But have a look who's here tonight. Look what God's done. But I want to tell you, don't just look at what he's done now to where we're at. But what I want you to really think about is I want you to imagine not too far away from now when we begin to have in excess of 1,000 people at night time. I want you to begin to imagine when we start to have churches from Cairns to Mount Isa, down to Longreach, down to Byron Bay, Coffs Harbour. I could go on with the list because I want to tell you something, I can see it. I want you to imagine when we have multiple churches overseas and there are flags up. Bougainville's just the beginning, let me tell you, because it's addictive. I want you to imagine what's going to happen. And that is why you're giving to not just now, but you're giving to the future. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, it says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you'll find it after many days. Today, Moses was mentioned, he's been mentioned often this week, and I was thinking about his mother, Jochebed. Think about being this mum, she's got a little baby boy, and there's risk for his life, and she takes her baby boy and she releases him. See, that's giving. Not a clenched fist, but it's giving. And she released her little baby boy on the water, released him, having no idea that he was going to grow up to become the deliverer of Israel. That is incredible when you think about it. See, when you give, that's how you have to think. Is when I let go of what I want to have for myself, that's when it begins to produce so much more. And these are the methodical steps of commitment. I'm going, to, I'm going to preach for our church soon a few sermons about commitment. We need a revival of commitment. 
Because the reality is, it is going to cost to keep preaching the gospel to more towns and more cities and more people. It's the reality. There's no getting around this. We'll have to continue to be like this till we get the job done. And it's not going to be done by the self-indulged or the entitled. Giving's always going to be by people who are a sacrificial servant who have that spirit that we see in the scripture. Who understand that this is bigger than themselves. Uh, Exodus 35.5, the previous chapter, this is amazing, uh, is it says, take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. That's the armor bearer. That's the sacrificial servant. It's a willing heart. That's really, a, at the end of the day, it's all about. It's how big your heart is. How much it means to you. How far you can see ahead. How, how much you want to you buy in and take responsibility. The reality of this conference, and we didn't have the money, we went into this in faith, is $35,000 plus for us to do this this week. And we have not covered that and so in the offering this evening I want to call on pastors I want to call on churches I want to call on disciples an offering will you help us will you help us get the bills paid I went and talked to the office today to find out how much we're up for and I nearly fainted (laughs) but you know what I believe there are incredible people here tonight with a willing heart who are able and who are prepared to get the job done. I want to show you in our scripture tonight in chapter 35, the spirit that we've got to fight for here. It says in verse 5 to 6 of chapter 36, they're beginning to bring in the offerings. It says, and they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. Oh God, give us men tonight. Give us women like that. See, when I got saved and I got birthed into this thing, you know what? It it was just, let's going to give everything for the sake of this course. And I tell you, I'm praying for that spirit. I'm praying for that to be revived in us because I believe in it. I really do believe it. 35 people in the day session in 2010 and look what God's done. And you know what what caused that? Just great people like you that are here tonight simply being a willing servant who said, "I, I, I want to do something for the kingdom of God. I've really prayed for this offering. There's some people here tonight. You could give thousands of dollars in this offering, just you personally. In your savings, it could be something that you're going to sell. But would you be a Barnabas? Are there women here tonight? You'd be a jock of bed. You'd say, you know what? I'm willing to give something up and make a, make a major sacrifice. I, I'm willing, just like she let go of a little boy Moses. I believe tonight that there are people here like Mary. I believe tonight there are many, but there's specifically some people. You can can help us get this conference paid for because we want want to get through this week. It's done and dusted. We move on. We're going to have another conference. And that's going to be exciting and there's going to be more because we need to help keeping preachers preaching. Are you with me tonight? So I want to receive an offering, please, if the ushers would come. And I want to appeal, would you have, like it says in Exodus 35, a willing heart? You probably found a little card on your seat. If you are going to give tonight, I believe you will. You mark on that how much that is. Most people these days uh, use internet banking. Uh, The bank details are on that card. If you are watching online, that's you I'm talking to right now. You're watching online and you want to give and you want to help this conference The bank details are on the website. If you would please find them and would you help us get this conference paid for because we're going to move on to bigger and better and even greater things. If you uh, make a decision tonight of what you're giving, I wonder if you would bring that in within 10 days. We need that within 10 days uh, so we can get all the bills paid for, we can wrap it up uh, and we could move on. If you have been blessed, if you've been helped in any way this week, uh, I'm asking you uh, to be a responsible person that will help meet the need tonight of this offering. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, tonight I pray that you will speak specifically to our hearts about what we can do. Oh God, I bind the spirit of mammon on this country that breeds such false trust in money and materialism and possessions. But God, we don't trust in horses, we don't trust in chariots, but we trust in the living God. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts what we will do to pay for this conference tonight. And God, let it be said of us with willing hearts that we'd have to be restrained from giving, that there would be no more need to give, that we could move on to other ventures and other exploits. And I pray all this tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for giving. and singers on the platform. Tonight we're blessed that we're going to have Ange come and do our special music from Ipswich. So let's make her feel welcome as she comes. Jeez, this is nerve wracking. Check mic one, two. All right, well, like it's been said, my name's Angie, I'm from Ipswich. And this song is called, Are You Ready? Even when we were still seniors God said that we were worth it So I went down on my knees and for forgiveness, repent that of my sin, leaving for Christ. Cause he is coming, 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 coming back soon. Are you ready, 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 ready? Oh, I'm running through the road like a track star. You're waiting another second. He is coming, 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 coming back. Are you ready? I'm here to tell you. A vapor you hit, then you're gone, then you stand before God. Are you ready, 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 ready? Cause He is coming, 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 coming back soon. Oh, I'm running to the road like a track star. You're waiting at the second. He is coming, 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 coming back. Are you ready? You never stop loving. 
your peace and your power just keep on standing there. The Bible said you're coming, he's coming back soon. He never stop loving your peace and your power just keep on standing there. The Bible said you're coming, I'm ready to go. Jesus is coming, 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 coming back soon. Are you ready, ready? Running to the altar like a track star. You're waiting at the second. He is coming, 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 coming back. Are you ready? Running to the altar like a track star. You're waiting at the second. He is coming, 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 coming back. Are you ready? Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much for that, Ange. Uh, tonight we're blessed that we have Pastor Huggins who's going to come and preach for us. And um, just the background on Pastor Huggins, he spent four years pioneering in Mackay and went back into Townsville for a period of time. That's where he um, uh, started attending the Potter's House. Amen. Back when Pastor Field was there. Um, back in the 90s. Amen. But tonight he's been in Lismore for now since 2011, I'm not going to do the math on that, amen, but he's been there since 2011 and he's, you know, done an awesome job. If you know anything about the guys that he's been there with and the people, the disciples that he's been able to raise up in that church, they are awesome, amen. So why don't we give Pastor Huggins a warm wild welcome as he comes up and preaches. My greatest fears in life was speaking in front of people, <laughs> and here I am, bless the Lord. So, it is my privilege to be here tonight, and I'm glad that you've taken it out of your schedule to come as well. Uh, what a great conference, eh? What some awesome preaching from some young men. I'm excited about that, you know. So, um, very, very good. I'm excited. I feel refreshed already. I thought, you know, after this morning's preaching, we could just have an altar call tonight. We could go all go to a restaurant and eat but I probably need to preach. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7 tonight. We're going to look at a portion of Scripture there, an event that happened in Jesus' life. I'm going to use some technology and try and time myself, just so I'm uh, being accountable tonight. September 2019, uh, my wife and uh, another couple from the Ch Lismore Church were able to go on an impact team to the Solomon Islands. God bless the Solomon Islanders. It is very obvious that they can sing. <clears throat> Amen. And uh, that impact team, we saw over 700 decisions, uh, countless miracles. People were getting healed on the street, out the front of the church. <clears throat> and it was an exciting time. But the one event that remains etched in my mind the most about that whole period there was we got it, received a call to go and visit a lady. Her name's Margaret. And Margaret lives in Naha Village, which is on the island of Guadalcanal. It's about 20 minutes uh, drive up a dirt road, because all the roads are dirt, uh, from Honiara. We passed broken vehicles on the way. There were stray dogs everywhere. There were little markets of people selling betel nut. Uh, and we eventually pulled up at the house, and it was a typical Islander-style house, uh, different colours of green, uh, it uh, looked like it needed a paint job, uh, and uh, thankfully they'd locked up their dogs uh, uh, in the yard. Uh, there's a wrecked car out the front, and we pull up not expecting too much there. We just asked to come and pray for a lady who's been diagnosed uh, with stage three cervical cancer. She went to the hospital, and the doctors literally said to her, listen, lady, you just need to go home and just make your life as comfortable as possible because there's nothing that we can do for you. And we walked into a room in the back of that house and there's a lady that's lying on a bed. She's quite frail. She's gaunt looking. She acknowledges us coming in. She doesn't speak a lot of words. And we begin to talk to her and I begin to speak to her and ask her why are we here? 
She tells me I've been diagnosed with this. The doctors have given me no hope. She'd recommitted her life to Jesus three days before that. And she asked if we could pray for her. And we spent a few moments. We prayed together. I prayed for her. And then there were long periods of silence. And I sensed in that moment that this woman met with Jesus. And as I reflected upon that event and we drove back into town and we went about our business for the rest of the revival, it occurred to me that what God had showed me was what the world's like. It's represented in that one person is the world that we live in. Diagnosed with a disease that is slowly destroying them. The verdict is final. There is no opportunity to fight it. There is something at work in the lives of every person on planet Earth. And if they were to go and see a spiritual doctor, their words would be, just make your days as comfortable as possible before it takes your life. And that lady stands out on the landscape of many years of living for God. She's an individual in a small rural setting that man can do nothing for her and a God steps into her life and brings salvation and brings healing. Church, unless someone goes to people like that, they will never come to you. Unless something is moved in your heart to, to go and visit and see and interact and relate to people like that, they are incapable of any change in their life. And tonight, I want to look at a woman in our text who meets with Jesus. And a woman and another man also in the same setting with totally different outcomes. So I want to preach a sermon I've entitled, Do You See This Woman? Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. And the Bible says, Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited Jesus, saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he, for, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose it's the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. You did, anoint, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want you to bow your heads. We're going to pray. Father, we come before you tonight. And God, I'm asking that you would invade this conference setting. God, that you would impress upon every heart, Lord God, the need to see people the way you see them. 
God, that every individual in this generation is worth laying down a life for. Father God, move upon our hearts and let us not be hard-hearted towards the harvest field that you've laid before us. I'm asking you to be glorified in this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to first of all consider with you the importance of an individual. We are involved in the greatest adventure on planet Earth. That Jesus Christ came, paid the price for his church, he paid the price for every man and every woman and he's given you and I the keys to do something with our lives and he literally says to every person who would name the name of Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. Every person needs to hear the gospel and this is the great adventure for, of uh, Christianity. We call it evangelism. It's reaching one person at a time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's reaching the next person. But you know, tonight what's been lost in the great Christian endeavour is the importance of the individual. You think about conference reports for a minute. It's all about numbers. Attendees at outreaches. Volumes of decisions. At what point did people become a number? I'm talking about real people. And for a moment of time, if we could focus on the individual. See, in reality, Margaret is a nobody to the world. Actually, the world doesn't even care about her or the outcome of her life, and why would they? There's so many other people to focus on. And the challenge with trying to focus on too many people at once sometimes leaves, leaves us influencing no one. You know, as this conference body grows, platforms are going to grow. Ministries are going to grow. But the danger is we can miss the mark when it comes to influencing the individual. And I want to declare to you tonight that God hasn't forgotten the individual. His focus is still upon the one soul. Look at Jesus' ministry. We know the scriptures that say he was moved with compassion when he saw what? He saw the multitudes. But what did he see in the multitudes? He saw individuals. Luke chapter 7, the text that I've read from you, Luke chapter 7 actually uh, details four interactions that Jesus has with people. The first one is the centurion with the sick son. The second one is Jesus is in a procession and goes to the city of Nain and he walks straight into a funeral procession and he interacts with the widow of Nain. Then he sends a message to his beloved friend and cousin, John the Baptist. And then he has an interaction with the woman in our text. But if you were to go through the Gospels, the Gospels is filled with the account of Jesus Christ, the saviour of humanity, reaching individuals, the Gadarene demoniac, Jairus' daughter, and we could spend a lot of time looking at each of those. But listen, Jesus hasn't lost his focus. Have you? Matthew chapter 18, 13 to 14 it says this. It says, and if he should find it, talking about the shepherd, who has lost one sheep out of the 199 are left. He said, if he should go and find the one that's lost, I surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that one sheep but over the 99 that did not go astray, even so is not the will of your Father in he who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It is not God's will that one person should perish. Think about Luke chapter 15, the, the uh, great chapter of the three things that are lost, all with the same theme. It's the lost coin. It's the lost sheep. It's the lost son. 
And in Luke 15, verse 7, Jesus says, And I say to you that likewise there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner, over one sinner who repents of their sin, than over 99 just persons who have no need of repentance. And in our text, Jesus asks the question, Do you see this woman as a person of focus, as a person to adjust your lens and look at her life because she represents something. She represents a fallen life stung by sin. One life stung by sin. But yet she doesn't just represent one life, she represents the lives of many people who are out there. See, it's sin that causes the greatest damage on the individual. It's sin that causes the greatest damage collectively on humanity. And if there would be here tonight a man or a woman who'd be affected by the Spirit of God, say, you know what, I'm going to reach one person. Imagine if we all reach one person this year. We wouldn't meet here next year. And in focusing on this woman, she represents the forgiveness of God and the continuing grace and God's mercies that flow to sinners on a regular basis. Yeah, this woman, it's not the first time this woman has met Jesus. Did you know that? But she walks past this house. She somehow knows he's in the house. She comes inside and she gives one of the most priceless things that she has. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The actual correct translation is your sins have been forgiven. She's probably come time and time again. And when you work with people, it would be so nice if they just got it the first time. True? But don't they come back time and time again? And it's right there that you and I as the church can say, you know what, these people are hard work. These people are difficult. But Jesus doesn't turn her away. Now all Margaret had left as we spoke to her is that she wanted just to once again to be able to sing for Jesus. But sin had affected her body. She told me, she said, I I left the Lord when I was younger. I should never have done that. And she's paid the price for that in her body. She paid the price for that. It's wrecked her life. Sin had affected her voice. And the answer for that woman, Margaret, and the answer for the woman in our text, and the answer for every individual is Jesus, who hasn't forgot the importance of, of the individual. I want to secondly consider with you the instinct of an individual. Our text tonight shows us of a fellowship at Simon's house, but it shows us of a meeting of two people who meet with Jesus in the same place. And it's not the first time for either of them, but they're going to receive this, they're going to perceive this and the outcome of their life is going to be totally different, yet they're in the same place. Think about the man that invites Jesus in. His name is Simon. He's a Pharisee. It says in our text, it says, now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, think about this guy. He invited Jesus into his life. Have you done that? But the problem with Simon bringing an, giving an invitation to Jesus in his life, the problem with that tonight is that Simon's still in charge. And we ask for people to make a call to respond to God, true? Why don't you invite him into your life? Listen, at what point do we just invite Jesus in like he's just a guest? And the reason I got saved because I sat in a building and the man never said, you need to invite Jesus into your life. What he said to me was, says, why don't you surrender to God? And can I tell you, that struck me 
like someone had hit me with a hammer. Why don't you surrender to God? Because if you did surrender to God, you wouldn't be in charge. It's interesting that in our text, Simon invites Jesus in. But internally, Simon's dialogue is still Simon talking to Simon. Because it says in our text, he said that he spoke to himself. Saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of man this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And maybe tonight, before we go any further, maybe tonight we need to consider, maybe there's some obvious signs of people who have just invited Jesus in as a guest. Maybe one of those tonight, like Simon, is you have opinions. But whether they agree with Christ or not, it just doesn't seem to matter. They're your opinions. Simon had opinions. Simon had an idea of how Jesus should be behaving in his life. If he were a prophet... Now, we don't say that, but maybe you've said in your heart, you know, if Jesus really is the the Lord, why isn't he doing this in my life? Shouldn't he be blessing me? Shouldn't it only be good things that come to my life because Jesus is the Lord? He was secretly critical. You know, what's interesting about the text is he never spoke this out loud. But Jesus heard his internal criticism. And Jesus responded to his internal criticism. It's very obvious with Simon that there's a hierarchy of righteousness. If this man were a prophet, he would know. Don't let that woman touch you. You know why? Because she's a sinner. And Simon, you're not. See, it's easy to be religious, isn't it? And maybe that can creep into our lives as well and we be actually, what we begin to do is aim at people who have something to offer us in return. And the individual who no one can help, who helps them? It's very obvious in Simon's interaction with Jesus that he's hostile in his heart towards Christ because when all you ever do is invite Jesus in to your life, you're not submitting to him because if you invite him in, you may show him the door as well. And Jesus answered and said to Simon, I have something to say to you, Simon. And Simon says, teacher, say it. This is spoken in hostility. Then he speaks that little parable. And then Jesus says, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the more? And Simon answers and said, I suppose it's the one who forgave him more. Jesus forces an answer out of this man that he doesn't want to give because it wasn't in his heart. And yet there's another person in that room that meets Jesus. And this is not by invitation, it's actually not her house. She somehow is just walking past the place and she finds out that Jesus is in the building. It says, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house. Doesn't react by just inviting him into her life. But she responds out of instinct. You know, if you'd present Christ to people, to an individual, they know how to respond. Instincts are very powerful things. You don't have to think. It's part of your nature. And she represents tonight someone who has been converted. She represents tonight someone who has been touched by God. And out of instinct, she recognises the Saviour's voice. Have you heard Jesus' voice this week? Have you heard it? Jesus said, you know who my sheep are? They're the ones who come to the potter's house.
Doesn't say that, does it? You know who my sheep are? They're the ones who come to conference. Doesn't say it, does it? Jesus says, you know who my sheep are? You know the ones who know how to respond out of instinct? Are the ones that hear my voice. Have you heard the voice of God this week? Have you heard it? Because it's come through the preaching. Somehow she has this perception. She just knew where he was. She knew where to find him. Who knows, maybe she walked past the house and heard his voice. I can't imagine Jesus was a boisterous man. And laughing loudly. Is that Jesus' laugh? (laughs) But some instinct is birthed in her heart because she's been deeply affected by his grace and by his mercy. It could have been any number of women that Jesus had previously met. It could have been the woman caught in adultery. It could have been the woman who was bent over for years and was healed. It could have been the woman with the issue of blood who reached out her hand. It could have been any number of sinful women, yet something was birthed in her life, an instinct born out of gratitude that the Saviour had touched her. Maybe there are some signs tonight of someone who operates the same way. Maybe one of those tonight is there's no argument about no arguing about what needs to be done. There's a need. I'll give it. She's not arguing. She's not bartering with God. She's not saying, what's the least I could do here to keep Jesus happy? There's no argument. Ask your question tonight. Do you find it difficult sometimes to do the will of God? Do you, do you fight God over that? Why? Don't you think that's the best place for you? Don't you think that's where God knows how to bless your life? God, God can bless you tenfold in the will of God. There's no argument from this woman about what to do. Another sign from this woman is there's no cost that's too high to pay. See, we're willing to pay a price, but we're also willing to set the price. And there's no cost that was too high to pay. This was expensive, fragrant oil. It was in an alabaster box, and she was willing to give that. This is probably an heirloom passed on to her to take care of, to pass on to your children. And she's willing to stop that chain of events and give this to the Saviour. Why? Because there's no cost that's too high to pay for the man that's forgiven me of my sins. It's a free will offering. What do our free will offerings look like in comparison? We just want to know how much needs to be paid. Let's just pay that. Another sign from this woman is that she has no fear of man. You know, this is not her house. And it actually was a lawful thing for her to enter, like for others to enter into these fellowship gatherings, but they are only allowed to enter in and stand along the walls and listen and observe and not be part of it. I can't imagine any one of us have a house like that. Because once we get home, it's lock the front door, keep the world, keep everybody out. But she breaks the culture. She transgresses the etiquette and she comes in because I need to talk to Jesus. Now the fear of man brings a snare, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And it's with this instinct that we need to hear Christ and what he's saying to the church Do you see this woman? 
You know what Jesus is saying? This is the type of person I'm trying to reach. And you and I can fall into the trap of thinking, you know, we just need to reach people that are just clean. Just their marriages are in order. Their families, listen, they work a job. Can I tell you how to reach good quality people? Is you train up sinners. You introduce them to Jesus. And you show them how to live for God. And if you've lost that tonight, have you begun to tell Jesus who he should be reaching? See, Jesus would have us focus in on this woman for a moment in time so that you and I would know what to do with our lives. Just to reach one person at a time. Yeah, how God builds a church? One person at a time. After years of doing what you've been doing, is there any change in anyone around you? And if there's not, maybe you're focusing on too many things. You just need to focus on the one. I want to thirdly look at the impact of an individual. So what we tend to believe is we have greater impact with more people. Is that true? It's not what my Bible says, by the way. God can save by many or by few. And the impact of a life is far more valuable and far more uh, proportional then you realise, you know, one person can impact a whole generation. One person. Oh, no, no, we need a whole team of people. One person can impact a whole city. You know, one person can impact a country town if you would go. There's some regional centres out there that are filled with women like Margaret if no one goes, they'll die in their sin. See, the impact of these two individuals in our text is highlighted. Simon's a Pharisee. He's religious. His life never extended past the boundaries of his own critical heart. Where does your boundary finish? Where's it end? And he'll forever be known as the Pharisee who is critical towards Jesus. Are you critical of other people tonight? Because if you are, your impact is very proportional. It's minimalized. How far do you think criticism gets you in life? And Jesus speaks to Simon and says, Simon, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave both of them. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose it's the one who he forgave more. And Jesus said, you have rightly judged. And he was referring to the woman. He says, Simon, you invited me into your life. You have done nothing for me. And this, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? She didn't invite me in. She just surrendered her whole life. And yet she leaves a legacy that 2,000 years later we still speak on, we still reference off of. See, the individual tonight is still in the most important part of God's plan of salvation. This woman left a legacy. Can you sense tonight what God is calling you to do? And would you just go and do it? Irrespective of what others say. Irrespective of what others would do. 
Can you sense what God's calling you to do and then would you just go and do it? And she left the legacy that no price, no earthly price is too high to pay to reach lost ones that Jesus is calling into the fold. I dare say there's not a person here tonight that's ever heard of a man called Private A. B. Little. Grew up in a small country town. Anyone ever heard of him? Little by name and maybe little by fame. No one's heard of the guy. But in the late 1800s, he grew up in a small country town in Queensland called Nebo. And back before Australia was even a nation, a federation, the Boer War was raging in South Africa. And the British Empire at the time were asking individual states, would you send men? And they asked Queensland to send some men. And A.B. Little heard about this. Nebo is 100 kilometres west of Mackay. The town's probably 300 people today. You don't even drive through the town, you bypass it on the highway. And yet he put his hand up and said, I'll go. And in going to South Africa, he could fight, he could shoot, he could ride a horse. That's why our Anzac soldiers are so great. They could do all the things that everyone else couldn't do. He went to the Boer War. This is before World War I. He was on a, he was on a train that was hijacked. And many people lost their lives and he escaped and was, was actually, he escaped the train wreckage, but he was taken hostage, POW, and put into a camp in Mafeking in South Africa. And a couple of days later, another man, an English captain, is thrown into the same camp. And Private Little, who in the eyes of history, his life wouldn't amount to much, decided that this English captain, who he doesn't even know, is probably worth me trying to help him escape. And he hatched a plan. And he helped that English captain escape from a POW camp. And Private Little wouldn't know that 40 years later that the man he helped escape entered into his destiny, that man's Winston Churchill. Think about that for a minute. An Aussie man in a small country town puts his hand up and says, I'm willing to fight, helps another man get set free and unlocks his destiny. Do you sense what God's calling you to do? Who knows the next individual that you and I would reach to help them escape the chains of sin, the impact that they could have on the world? They were going to shoot Winston Churchill. He helped him escape and he entered into his destiny 40 years later. Margaret, on the last night of revival, I'm standing on the stage and Pastor Adrian leans over to me and says, that lady you prayed for is here tonight. She's in the fourth row. And I focused in on her. She looked a lot healthier than I saw her three days earlier. She had a light in her eye. And she'd asked the pastor if she could get up and sing. She was smiling and she sang the song that we sang tonight because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Do you see this woman? Do you see what she represents? Do you see the focus that God has on individuals like that? Are you trying to reach people like that? See, if you would lay down your life for people like that, who knows the destiny that could be unlocked in their lives?
this woman's influence has lasted over 2,000 years. I want you to bow your heads tonight. I want you to close your eyes. I appreciate your attention this evening and I sense that the Spirit of God is in our midst working upon the hearts of people. Before I go any further tonight, I mentioned a lady whose name was Margaret. She's Solomon Islander. Her life is wrecked by sin. But when she met Jesus, everything changed. Before I go any further, you're here tonight and you know at the sound of my voice, you're not right with God. You're not right. You're not right with Jesus. You know that. I want to give you an opportunity. Not to invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Saviour. But I want to give you an opportunity. You could surrender your life to Him right now and He would change it. No one's looking around. No one's moving around at the moment. But you're not right with God and you know in your heart, I need to get right with God. I need to get my life right because sin is wrecking my life. It's taking away my life. And I want to stop that. And I want to start again. That's you tonight. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. I have someone pray with you. Maybe you're backslidden tonight. Maybe there's a distance between you and the Lord tonight. You need to reconcile. You want to get your life right with God, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, I want to talk to the church. I want to talk to Christians. God hasn't lost sight of the individual. Actually, the reason why you're saved and still here on planet Earth tonight, Christian, is because God can see the individuals that only you can reach. And what Jesus is concerned about is whether they're going to make it to heaven. the heartbeat of God can you sense God speaking to you tonight would you just reach out to the next sinner yeah but Lord they have nothing to offer they're the people Jesus is looking for because he can build something out of their lives listen there are people that are trapped in their sin and you have the ability to help them escape from their sin And who knows the destiny that would be unlocked. I'm going to open up the altar tonight. I believe God's working upon hearts, working upon people tonight. You want to come and pray tonight and make a fresh commitment. Lord, I'm going to give myself to reach the people that you put in front of me. I don't care what other people say. I don't care if they mean nothing to anybody else. They mean something to you, Lord. God, rescue us from being religious. God, rescue us from being a people that can't see what you can see. God, that we would see this woman and we would see other men and other women whose lives are bound in sin. God, use us. Affect our lives, Father God, with your Spirit. You've given us grace so freely. God, forgive us that we've set the price that we need to pay. God, forgive us that we begin to look at people like they're unreachable. And Father, move upon our hearts that we would go to the places that you would call us to go to. Father, that there would be no arguments, that we would just go that you'd use our lives to reach a precious people. God, send your Holy Spirit to this altar and fill every heart with a fresh desire and instinct to respond to you.
Tonight, let's sing that song. My spirit magnifies the Lord, and my soul praises His name. Death could not hold Him captive, even in the grave. Jesus is born, even in the grave. Jesus. Let's lift our voices and tell Jesus we love him tonight. Oh God, we worship you. Father, we thank you for what you're doing, oh God. God, let us not lose sight of what you are about, oh God. God, let us see the individual. Let us see the lost sinner, Father God. God, move upon us tonight, I pray. God, be glorified in the midst of your people. Father, we thank you. God, we rejoice in your presence tonight. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you and we lift you. Let's give God praise tonight. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. Give you all the praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you would give yourself to seeking God, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be? And listen, it doesn't matter the postcode. It matters the people. All right? You give yourself to those people and you see God move. God's in, into this generation. He's into what we do, church. You've got to see what he sees. I mean, let's give God praise as the pastor is going to come tonight and close it. Amen. Awesome word this evening. Um, back here tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock for prayer, 9 o'clock for our first se um, session. Amen. Um, let's leave in a word of prayer and I'll get Brother Jade if you can seal our prayers tonight. Mm -hmm.